music is um, being generated by a very inexpensive computer chip microcontroller uh, from an Arduino compatible kit that I make called RU Touch, and it's open hardware. Like everything I do is open source, um, so it's a thirty dollar kit that anyone can make. And um, yeah, I'm pretty pleased with the result. It can make beautiful or cheesy, depending on your point of view, sounds, or it can make nasty noises, uh, and you can program it for all sorts of things. But I'll turn that off now. <laughs> Not that one. Okay, so, um, yeah. This is my contact information. Please feel free to contact me anytime for any reason. I totally love helping people any way that I can, uh, whether with a project or starting your own small company, if you're depressed, whatever, um, you've been to all these places. So, um, yeah, I'll show that again later. Feel free to take a picture. I also have uh, cards here with all the info, and I've also got stickers and Lace Bridge stickers. And, uh, nice bridge. Nice bridge. I, I like stickers. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so. Uh, I'm not really a fan of conventional wisdom. Um, I think it's really important to learn from the experience of others, but if you're going to live a life that you really love, uh, that has personal meaning for you, you've really got to go out and do things in your own way a lot of times. And especially if you want to be an entrepreneur, you definitely have to learn from others, but definitely do things in your own way. And um, as an entrepreneur, um, I've definitely done things that are really stupid. Uh, that have enabled me to succeed. Let me uh, just start a timer here. So um, yeah, so doing stupid things that have allowed me to um, learn from my mistakes, but also to succeed in doing things that you're not supposed to do according to conventional wisdom. And indeed, Silicon Valley here didn't start because people were doing conventional things. There were a bunch of total weirdos who were passionate about computers at a time when computers were just for total geeks. You know, in the 1970s, computers weren't a thing. They were for these, these engineers with thin ties from the 50s. And um, these were freaks. These were total freaks who didn't know what they were doing, but they were passionate about computers, and they got together in community and taught each other what they needed to do in order to make a personal computer and start uh, and then, you know, see that there were opportunities from there that other people thought it was cool once they got it going. And they saw opportunities and started companies, some of which, well, one of which is one of the biggest corporations on the planet now. Um, and this is, this is what happens when people are passionate about what they do and come together to support each other. And I'll talk more about that. Um, I'm going to touch on a bunch of uh, themes that uh, both Marco and Danielle uh, talked about, uh, but from my own perspectives. Um, but I am totally a happy worker. <laughs> I create my own work. I've never wanted a job. I knew that as a little kid. I never wanted a job. That sounded totally depressing. Um, but I learned uh, eventually um, to create my own work and do what I love and make a living doing what I love. But I did start off totally depressed. Um, the first half of my life was nothing but total despair and misery. And I'm not exaggerating. Uh, starting off as a little kid, being an introverted geek, and being bullied for being an introverted geek, and being gay, and being fat, and being you know, whatever, intelligent, whatever bullies beat people up for. And often while teachers watched, especially gym teachers, the only thing good about the lack of money for education now is the lack of gym teachers. But, um, uh, yeah, so, you know, my, my parents were clueless. They were depressed as well. They didn't really want kids. They just with what, what they were supposed to do. Um, so, you know, when I got home, I just retreated into the magical world of television. Kids on TV, unlike me, were beautiful had loving parents, understanding friends, problems that resolved by the end of the show. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally depressing. I just sat there and time went away. I would eat junk food, getting more unhealthy, more fat. 
I would um, uh, not do anything useful like learn how to deal with other kids or, or do anything worthwhile. Time went away and I would become more of a target as a result at school only to retreat more into television when I got home to try to avoid my pain. Can you say addiction? <laughs> I am a TV addict. And um, I still am, even though I quit TV a long time ago. But um, TV uh, was just my first addiction. There are many ways of avoiding oneself, and I'll just talk about just a few of them briefly of what I've tried to do to avoid my pain and avoid myself. Geeking out is something I way loved as a kid and still love. Um, you know, electronic parts just do what they're told, and you can make so many cool things with them, but it's totally solo. And this is one of the things that kids were beating me up for. Other kids were beating me up, and so uh, I wondered why I was doing all of this. And um, another thing is travel. My family, 1960s, middle class, we did the, uh, the usual torture ritual of dumping the kids in the back of the station wagon, picking a direction, and calling it vacation. <laughs> But uh, there were a lot of cool things about it. I saw a lot of things that are totally amazing, and even though we, we, we didn't kill each other, uh, but we wanted to, and, uh, but it gave me the travel bug, and uh, I still have that today. But there's aspects of travel, um, and maybe, Danielle, maybe you can relate to this aspect that can be kind of escape. And, um, you know, things are, can be a mixed bag. So, uh, at this point, I, I also have to talk about hot because <laughs> it saved my life really in my high school all you had to do to be considered cool was to smoke pot I suddenly started enjoying being around other kids and uh, it also led to my first very popular invention which was an electronic bomb <laughs> Feeling trapped at work is another great way to avoid oneself. I learned this from my workaholic father. I applied it to myself in my first real job, which I hated, but paid me well, and I had a beautiful rent-controlled apartment, but in a city I did not like at all. Choice is a really powerful thing. I was an uptight, TV-watching closet case living in a town I didn't like, trapped in a job I didn't like, and I made those choices. It was time for new choices. I never liked TV, even as a little kid. Work eight hours, sleep eight hours, and watch TV with what little time is left? Hell no! But what else to do? Well, I started by quitting my job that I hated, buying a VW van, and moving away from Boston. <laughs> that was the town I didn't like. And, um, um, yeah, and one choice from there leads to another, to another, and um, I'm traveling. You know, and the only choice, really, at that point, traveling with no destination, is what direction to go when. You know, and, choice after choice, and eventually I'm in Alaska at my first consulting gig, ripping the guts out of fish covered in slime, knee-deep in fish heads at a fish cannery, and loving it. <laughs> and three weeks later, <laughs> when I quit that job, hating it, I realized that for the first time in my life, I'd actually been happy all because of the choices that I made. So from there, proceeding down the West Coast, I eventually run into Silly Valley, which most people call Silicon Valley, um, where I could sling bits rather than sling slime for a living, and make enough money in three months to, to, work, uh, to not have to work the rest of the year, which I thought was really cool. But after, um, about a decade of that. I wanted more than just a cool life. I wanted a life that I actually loved living. So this is in 2003. I had an experiment that I performed on myself. I saved up enough money so I could live a year without working at all. I was lucky enough to be able to do that. 
And I wanted to see what life would be like if I only chose what I loved to do in that year. I didn't know how I would make money, but I assumed there have to be some ways of, getting, of making enough money doing what I love to keep doing what I love. I didn't know what it would be, so I did more volunteer work, because there was a bunch of volunteer work which I really loved doing. And there were also a whole bunch of projects, geeky projects, that I had been thinking about for like 10 years, but didn't play with, because when I got home from work in electronics, I didn't feel like playing in electronics. But now I had plenty of time and plenty of energy, and I had these ideas, so I started working on them. And one of these projects got on a roll, and it's called TV Be Gone. And uh, I quit TV, I got rid of all of my TVs, and I had a lot of them in 1980 from my apartment. And, um, uh, but then in 93, it's kind of hard to imagine nowadays, but in 93 there weren't many TVs in public places, but they started popping up everywhere. And it was driving me crazy. You know, like if a TV were on here, I wouldn't be able to be doing this. I would just be <laughs> staring at it. Even when I tell myself, stop doing that, and I would just gravitate back to it. But um, yeah, so uh, I became obsessed with this idea of getting rid of them. Well, I couldn't get rid of them, but I'm a geek, so I figured out how to make a remote control to turn them all off, so I did. <laughs> and it turns out that it took a year to do it, because there were all sorts of obstacles in the way, and um, uh, like they don't publish the codes, and recording the codes from the universal remote controls that I bought was a lot harder than I thought, and I had to make my own data acquisition system, which was a logic analyzer, which was $10,000, cheapest at the time, now they're $150, but back then, yeah, so anyways, there were all these obstacles, but eventually I had a prototype, and I could go all over San Francisco, turning TVs off in public <laughs> places, and enjoying it. A lot. And my friends, of course, were totally excited about it, and I made one for all my friends, and they were enjoying turning TVs off all over San Francisco, and they told their friends, and they were excited about it, and many of them told their friends, and that's when I thought, wow, maybe there's an opportunity here. I made this thing just for me because I love it, but it turns out there's all these people that want it, so I took a total gamble, and I made as many as I could afford, which was 20,000. <laughs> and I did the math. If I could sell 5,000, I could break even. And even if it took five years or even 10 years to sell all those 5,000, I'd break even and there'd be 5,000 people turning TVs off all over the world. And I thought that would be really cool. But um, as it turned out, I was totally wrong. I did not sell those 5,000 in five years or even 10 years. I sold all 20,000 in three weeks. Wow. <laughs> and it's all because of a Wired.com article that came out that determined my first day of sales. And because of that, uh, NPR called me and did an interview with me at 9 a.m. By noon, the website crashed from so much web traffic. The New York Times called me and they stayed with me for four days. Uh, I was on Fox News turning TVs off in their studio live, like 10 million people watching, and People, people Magazine, I mean, like me on People Magazine, this is crazy, an introverted geek, and I got to start getting invited to give public talks, you know, I'm an introverted geek, like how am I going to give public talks? It turns out I, I kind of like it. But back then, it was, it was really scary. And all of this comes because I was working on something for me that I love. And this, I think, is really, really key. And it brings up my definition of success. And here's the one slide that has a bunch of text on it. And I think it's important. Success has a lot of definitions. A lot of them, I think, are really narrow. It doesn't have anything to do with money. Money is just one resource out of lots of resources. But if you can somehow find, explore, and find what you love doing, and then do what you love doing, and somehow get enough of what you need to live by doing what you love, what could be, what could be better than that? What could be more successful than that? TV, TV.
two friends of mine made a TV commercial for TV Be Gone. <laughs> yeah, it was a collaboration between friends who didn't know each other before that, but all of them were TV Be Gone fans, so it was, it was pretty fun. So, um, I just want to point out a, a couple of, uh, well, this is one incredibly stupid mistake that I made. You know, I put together this company really fast with friends who just happened to be all in a place where they could quit whatever they were doing or they were looking for what's next. And we started this company, Cornfield Electronics, to make TV be gone remote controls. And we've sold a half a million <laughs> since then. So it's been 13 years. We sold a half a million and me and 12 friends have made a living from this for that, which I think is fantastic success. And I don't make a lot of money, but I make enough to do everything I do. Um, but one thing that was incredibly stupid is I didn't know anything about business. You know, like I bought these things for $3 each. That's what my manufacturer charged me in China, in Shanghai. And, um, and I heard a rule of thumb, well, you know, retail can be five times that. So $15, wow, $12, my overhead can't be that, can it? So um, the first 100,000 TV Be Gone units I sold in the first three months. It was crazy, all this publicity. Um, and um, I didn't have time to do bookkeeping. When I finally had time to catch up on my bookkeeping, I was paying all of my friends uh, a good rate and I would get what's left. And it turned out what's left was zero. <laughs> and I'm lucky it wasn't negative, because <laughs> that would have been it for the company. I was just totally lucky that it wasn't negative. Um, but it was zero, and that was a lot of stress and work, and it was stressful, I'll tell, I'll, I'll tell you, but uh, way fun as well, and um, I had zero. If I would have charged 20 instead of 15, well, this is America, 14.99 is what I sold it for, and I raised the price to 19.99. Um, if I would have sold it for that at the beginning, I don't think I would have had any less sales, and I would have had a half a million dollars. To do something with, <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> so uh, think about that if you do anything like in retail. Uh, choose your costs, uh, your price uh, well. And um, I also want to point out funding. So things are easier now than they were in 2003 to 2004, but even now, conventional wisdom, which I'm not a fan of, says that you have an idea, you patent it, and then you get a VC, a venture capitalist, who gives you a pile of money. Patents are totally useless unless you're uh, working for Samsung and your job is to sue someone else who works at Google or Apple. Um, it's just a huge, huge, huge amount of money and you have no recourse um, uh, if anyone infringes on your patent except to spend months of your life and hundreds of thousands of your dollars. Um, so, uh, and then funding. VCs, they have money. They also have a lot of assholiness. <laughs> That's what they're best at. They take over your company, they will do everything they can in order to, oh, my opinion. <laughs> they will do everything they can to get 50.001% of your company, and when they do, they will make incredibly stupid decisions because they think they know what they're doing and they don't. As a consultant working for hundreds of Silly Valley corporations, and 100% went through this, I think I know what I'm talking about. The exceptions are so rare, and when you complain about their stupid decisions, they will just fire you, and you are out of their way, and now your hopes and dreams are squished into the ground. And like I said, this is the norm. The exceptions are so rare that you can say they don't even happen. <sighs> Again, my opinion, you don't have to agree with me, but please consider that. There's crowdsource funding. The VCs can come in really, really well if you're profitable and you need some money that's at risk that VCs can, are really good for. And um, then they can't take over 50% of your company, and it's still your company, it's just with some of their investment. So,
so um, I can talk more about that at another time. Uh, but doing TV Be Gone got me invited to the first Maker Fair. That was in 2005. And I, I couldn't believe I didn't hear about it. Um, it, it was just amazing. There were all, uh, what was it? It was 50 geeky people all with a little table showing off some really cool, very diverse projects. And I just knew I wanted to be part of that. And there was no one making anything. So the next Maker Fair, I started teaching people what I loved, which was soldering. It's totally stupid, but it's really fun. And it's a great, great skill. And it's just fun. You can make so many things. You can fix things. And um, so it grew to be rather large. I also started writing for Make Magazine. I uh, had been thinking about, um, oh, here it is, uh, this project, which has blinking lights and sound with a uh, recording that it plays back through light and sound of meditation. And meditation is one of the things which I greatly benefited from while I was depressed, like with Marco, and it, it's one of the things that allowed me to learn to live a life I love. And um, uh, so I thought if I had a project which could induce meditation into people who wanted it, uh, and also intriguing enough that it would make people make something that they wouldn't have made otherwise, uh, then that would be a success. And it turned out to be one of Make Magazine's most popular projects. And the allure of this is because as you go into a really, really wonderful meditative state, you hallucinate colors and patterns. And it turns out people kind of like hallucinating. <laughs> so uh, this is a, a kit that I still have and it's still popular. Um, and Brie Pettis, who later, well, I'll just show you this, this weekend a snippet of Let me show weekend. you what this looks like when you put them on. There's the glasses, and here's the headphones, and then let's turn it on. So there you go, that's kind of, that's what you'll hear and see when you put these on. I'm Bree Pettis here with Mitch Altman, and this project is in Make Magazine Volume 10. Go ahead and get it, get the parts, make it on up, and have a great weekend. <laughs> yeah, so Bree, uh, I became friends with him instantly in the first Maker Fair, and we've been friends ever since. He went off to start NYC Resistor Hackerspace. I'll talk about hackerspaces in a bit, and um, uh, to co found MakerBot, uh, the first cheap. 3D printer, and they sold, that was in um, a few years ago, and they sold for almost a billion dollars um, uh, last year, was it? And um, yeah, and kind of crazy, and this is again, people doing what they love. Um, I had uh, another thing that came from uh, Hackerspace Noise Bridge, one that I co-founded, which is a sleep mask, which is a more complex version of this, you don't hallucinate, it just helps you sleep if you're having trouble. Um, it was a successful Kickstarter, and I was also nine months late, <laughs> which is not bad for a Kickstarter, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Also, um, uh, I got invited to my first hacker conference, and I'd never heard of hacker conferences um, up until that point. You know, what is what, what are hackers, you know? According to the media, they're people who break into your computers and steal shit. Uh, is that what they do at these hacker conferences? Well, no, they don't. They, it's, it's like a maker fair, but even way cooler because it's not just 50 people with a table. It's thousands of people all uh, sharing things enthusiastically about what they love doing. And it's so amazingly high to be around thousands of people who love what they're doing. It's unfortunately and sadly not like the world at large where it seems like hardly anyone loves what they're doing. They're just doing what they're doing hoping to get by, but at these things it's totally high, and, um, and then the, the conference ends. But at this one, um, they invited me to my second conference, which was the 23rd Chaos Computer Club Conference, Chaos Communications Conference, they, uh, uh, Congress is the German word, and, um, and I, I was hooked for life. And, um, and my, my third one, which was every four years they have an outdoor camp, um, it's amazing. I mean, these are pictures from it. They have hundreds of talks. They've got uh, a spaceship. <laughs> I did workshops. There's lasers. There's all sorts of... There's a disco ball in the trees. Um, there's food. There's music. There's dancing. There's people sharing enthusiastically and learning from each other. It's just amazing. And there was a talk about how to start your own hackerspace. And the thing that's terrible about these hacker conferences is they end. 
really high with all these thousands of people surrounded by thousands of people who love what they're doing and it ends and you're back in like the so-called real world where people don't all love what they do and it's kind of a, a letdown but uh, if there were a hacker space in my hometown we could just keep this kind of stuff going all year round that's what I was thinking so anyways Bree was there and Nick was there and we start and I was there and we started these first three hackerspaces in the United States and we helped each other with the help of the hackerspaces in Germany and that was in 2007 and here we are with 3,500 hackerspaces now in the world and we started a hacker uh, a website called hackerspaces.org where, where anyone can list their hackerspace either forming or that already exists, and it's a resource for um, hackerspaces to help each other and to get going and to thrive. Uh, Noisebridge is this amazing place. I started teaching soldering uh, every Monday. I call it Circuit Hacking Mondays, and I um, it was just an early one in 2008. It kind of grew kind of big rather quickly, and um, I started uh, doing this all over the world. Here's one that was just last Saturday at Noisebridge, me teaching all those people how to solder and play with Arduinos. Uh, here's one at one of those big hacker conferences in Germany. Um, I started traveling all around the world doing these workshops to giving talks. Uh, fortunately, there were other cool people at Noisebridge who could take over Circuit Hacking Monday, and the person doing it now is sitting right there. His name's Jay, and he's doing a fantastic job, and it's still really popular. It's totally cool. So anyways, I am going all over the world and just, you know, like, uh, why am I invited to do this? I don't go out of my way to find places to go. People ask me because I do what I love and I can share that with other people and I guess people like it, so they keep inviting me and I'm getting paid now to give talks, to give workshops. And like, here's at a school in India last summer I did a, a TEDx Brussels talk about hackerspaces, which helped lots of hackerspaces get going, giving workshops all over the world in various places. You know, this is just the teeniest, teeniest little fraction giving talks, big ones and little ones. This was just um, um, four months ago in China, uh, talking to a whole bunch of bureaucrats. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, uh, but again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Maker Fairs grew to be a huge part of me, and um, uh, I put my heart and soul into it, and teaching 3,150 people to solder in two days. <laughs> Every Maker Fair, and there were a lot of them around the world by the end. And in 2011, I got what I think is the best honor of my life, which was um, to get what the Make, Maker Fair people called the Mitch Altman Maker Hero Award, and they awarded me the first one. Aww. And um, if you want to see a video of me crying for joy, <laughs> you can find that online. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it's the last, the first and the last Mitch Altman Maker Hero <laughs> Award. <laughs> and no offense, Danielle, but um, I quit Maker Fair when they took a $10 million DARPA grant. Um, I just can't. Uh, I, I struggled with this for three months and talking with the organizers of Maker Fair and trying to find some way I could continue to help with Maker Fair without being associated with military money. And I couldn't find a way, and they couldn't find a way, and eventually I quit. And um, yeah, and that was that left a hole in me. Um, but when you stop doing one thing, no matter how cool or uncool it is, you have time for something else, and that's what got me invited to give this TEDx Brussels talk. They actually invited me because of that, and um, that's what really started me giving a lot of talks all over the world, and here's one just in Rio de Janeiro from um, um, a few months ago when I was there. That was my last trip. That was in uh, uh, January. <laughs> I came home to... Uh, on January 20th, which was an interesting time to come home to our country. You know, it's interesting, um, I travel all over the world, and especially in Europe, people uh, quite often, because of whatever is happening here, and there's a lot of things happening in our country, people ask me, um, what's with you people? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, people were really asking it now. They're even asking that in China. <laughs> so, like, that's something. So, anyways, I, I, I manufacture in China, and so I started bringing people to China to show them how manufacturing works. Most people don't really know how these things come to be, and um, uh, it's kind, it's fascinating. And also, I would show people the, the resources there, the pluses, the minuses, the cool things, the uncool things. Uh, but it grew, and um, we're being welcomed by all sorts of people. This is in the Beijing airport for three trips ago, and um, you know, I started giving talks about hackerspaces, and it just filters up. Here's the mayor of uh, a big uh, city that no one ever heard of because it only has six billion people, Zhangzhou, um, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, uh, but it, it eventually filters all the way up to the head of government. This is Premier Li. He's the head of state visiting a hackerspace that I helped organize uh, in China. It was, or well, it was organized by all these people there, but you know, I, I played a small part. It was just amazing. The head of state visits there and says, this is the future of China for the economy and for education. Not to be left behind, our president has a White House Maker Fair a year later. Um, so, um, yeah, hackerspaces uh, are a real center of my life now, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap things up, but I just wanna show you that hackerspaces really are about community. There's all these tools, amazingly cool things, but it's mainly community of people supporting each other to explore and do what each person finds personal meaning in doing, what they love doing. And the, you know, like, look, they're, they're just learning to solder. <laughs> you know, like, they're just solder. But look how happy they are. You know, it's really, whatever people do, they come together and support to do what they love doing. It's really just an excuse for being part of something bigger than oneself. Because we need that. We need to explore creatively, and we need community. And hackerspaces provide that. And they all get different tools, like mechanical, but this is my definition of hacking. Uh, the world is full of resources. We can use those resources any way we want. It doesn't have to be the way that they were intended to be used by whoever put them there. We can use them any way we want to improve our projects, and then we share it. That's what hacking is as we do it at Hackerspaces. And we do it because we love it. It's a way of living a mindset, and we really need this for entrepreneurship. You can be an entrepreneur without being a hacker, but you won't be a good one. You can be a hacker without being an entrepreneur and be a good hacker, but you don't have to be an entrepreneur. But to be a good entrepreneur, you must be a good hacker. And everything can be hacked, not just tech, but everything. <laughs> And there's lots of different cool tools at hackerspaces all over, including art. I mean, that's a class we had at Noisebridge. And food, and all ages. And we learn, we teach, we share. And it's project-based learning. It's fantastic. 100% of every person who comes to my workshops goes out of their way to want to learn. Why isn't school that way? And this is how true innovation happens. When people find, explore, and then find what they love, it's unique to them, it's perfect for them and their community. If other people in the community love it, then people will pay them to do it, and that's when you have a fantastic opportunity for entrepreneurship and a startup which is worth starting rather than some stupid idea which we see all over San Francisco and Silly Valley because people are thinking, first and foremost, I'm gonna make money. <laughs> That's stupid. How are you going to make money? Oh, I'll, I'll make an app. <laughs> That's why we have so many stupid apps. So anyways, um, <laughs> I have lots more I could talk about, but um, uh, people all over the country and the world are creating spaces like this because they're copying Silicon Valley. They want, they're copying Silicon Valley buildings. This is not where magic happens. <laughs> magic happens when community of people come together to support each other and people explore and do what they love doing, like they're doing in these other places. Like here's just a bunch in China from re my recent trip there. Um, people of all ages doing things. We can have people from the outside, hackers and residents coming and you know, there's just all these great things. And uh, education is now like this, people taking tests 
It's gotten so bad that teachers get fired if they take time out to actually teach something worthwhile. That's not okay. We need real education, and the hackerspaces can provide that, and schools are starting to have them. So um, play-based learning is where it's at, project-based learning. So let me whip through these. Once we have ideas, then we need, not this, <laughs> but we need um, uh, real co-working spaces and perhaps incubators. But again, entrepreneurship has to happen this way. Explore, try things, see what works, what doesn't, fail. <laughs> it sucks, but fail, learn from it and try again. And repeat, keep doing that, keep trying things, see what you love, keep doing it, learn from it, share with others, be supported by others. Eventually you find something that you love that other people are excited about and when you do, now you have the opportunity for a startup. We need these creative environments in schools, universities, libraries, incubators, accelerators, whatever, communities. This is what hackerspaces are about. If we wait for our governments to provide any of this for us, we are all just going to be dead. <laughs> we need to do this for ourselves, and if governments want to help, fucking A, great. But we, this is what we need to do for ourselves and the people around us, and this is how we provide opportunities for everyone. So, um, yeah. So let me just show you, uh, I want to invite you, this is another project I'm working on for two years and it's finally coming together. Here's a three second video. He's controlling that with his brainwave, or he's trying. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> the left side is brain, the right side. The actual performance, uh, oh, here, that's my friend Cal, and he's working on this one. And then uh, my friend Jonas is trying to control this one with his brain waves. <laughs> it's kind of getting close. I guess it likes his ass. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, this, the first performance of these is at the lab, which is a small gallery at uh, 16th near Mission. So you're all invited to that. It's, um, it's, it should be fun. Uh, I'm still working on it, so uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, also, you are all totally welcome to come to Noise Bridge Hackerspace, which is at 18th and Mission. And it's always open and always free. Just ring our buzzer, and if you've never been there, someone will let you in and give you a tour, and you're welcome to come as much as you like. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thanks again. Jay, can you talk to us about your favorite hack? My favorite hack? You know, like, the, the, the thing, um, for me, I don't play favorites. Like, it's not about whether I like something or not. It's about if the person doing it loves it or not. If the person loves doing what they're doing, then I'm happy. <laughs> and if I can help support them to continue doing it or to explore, to find whatever it is, that's what makes me excited, not what the thing is in itself. In your opinion, what is the best way that hacker spaces could uh, financially support itself without getting funds from governments or corporates? Uh, yeah, so there's lots of ways. You know, th there's thousands of hacker spaces in the world, and we need millions. Um, but uh, they've been growing exponentially, so maybe that'll happen uh, for more people to have opportunities. But very few hacker spaces have failed, um, and uh, of the ones that failed. I only know of one that failed because of finances, and that's out of thousands of them. So people find different ways of making it work. At any place in the world, there's assets and there's things that are challenges. In San Francisco, there's some people who are really rich, um, and they can provide money, um, 
and NoiseBridge, uh, we actually fund our $70,000 annual budget with thousands of small donations only. Um, other places um, have most of their income from membership dues. A lot of places around the United States, they also charge for classes and workshops, and that provides um, a good part of their income along with membership dues. And um, uh, the teachers get a percentage of that, so they get a good stream of teachers. In San Francisco, we just have so many geeky people and art people and whatever, um, people are willing to do it for free, and, um, and then do people donate if they want to. Um, outside of the United States, donation-based um, organizations don't work so well. So like in Europe, and especially in, in Asia, people just don't do that very readily. So they have to come up with other models, and membership models work well. You know, and like places that are economically depressed, like Detroit or Manchester, UK, um, um, places are cheap. They can get rent a place, a beautiful place, for almost nothing. Of course, there's not much money there. Um, but somehow they all make enough money doing what they're doing to help it keep going. Uh, yeah, on the other side of San Francisco, <laughs> people here have a bunch of money, but <laughs> rent is outrageous. This is the most expensive place in the world, as Marco pointed out earlier. And um, yeah, so, um, uh, but all places have their assets and their challenges, but the community comes together with a vision which collects enough people to make it work, because people love this stuff. And there also are municipalities, states, and countries that are supporting it in schools and museums and libraries and just community centers. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, well, since you would like to hear more about it. Actually, I want to hear one thing that you talked to me, and I think it should be very important. Can you tell us why? in the STEAM projects, the A is most important. Right, so um, there's a big push in the United States and everywhere in the world for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And those things are really important. But it's not about science, technology, engineering, and math. It's about people living lives that they feel themselves, that they feel themselves are way worth living. We live in a world, unfortunately, where I think a vast majority of people don't feel their lives are awesome. They're just living a life that they are hoping they can just get by. And they have jobs they don't like, they have jobs they hate, if they, and they feel lucky even if they have a job that they hate. That sucks. What kind of a world is this to live on? It's the one we're on. It's the one that elects these people. <laughs> and, um, you know, STEM is really a push by the U.S. military because they're afraid that, in, uh, that education sucks so bad, and it does, that they won't have enough qualified engineers to make weapon systems in the future, and they won't. And I hope they won't, even if there are good scientists and technologists and engineers and mathematicians. Um, but um, all of that's meaningless unless you have what people inserted into that, which is the A for art. And that's a catch-all term for creativity and joy and meaning to make it all worthwhile. We need all of these things. You know, ideally we want school to be like the workshops at hackerspaces. No one gets out of bed in the morning and goes, oh, I'm so tired, I don't want to get up and go to the hackerspace. <laughs> that doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen because people want to go to a hackerspace. It's enjoyable, it's wonderful, it's creative, it's supportive. Unlike schools, most schools. People, anyone here has been to a school where they were joyful to get out of bed in the morning to go to. You are so amazingly lucky. I certainly wasn't one of those people. Um, so, um, yeah, the A is super important and call it STEAM, but, um, but whatever you want to call it, education should be about learning a lifetime of learning. And that is totally enjoyable. Cool, thank you.